Woman and Socialism by August Bebel, Chapter Eleven: The Chances of Matrimony. One, the numerical proportion of the sexes. The usual advice to women to seek their salvation in marriage, this being their true profession, is thoughtlessly approved of by the vast majority of men. But it seems like mockery that many of these who give such advice and of those who applaud it refrain from marrying themselves. Schopenhauer, the philosopher, has only the conception of a philistine concerning women and her position. He says, "Woman is not called upon to perform great tasks. Her char- her characteristic is not doing but suffering. She pays her debt to life by the throes of childbirth." Care of her child and submissiveness to her husband, the supreme expressions of vitality and perception are denied her. Her life should be more tranquil and insignificant than man's life. Woman is called upon to be the nurse and educator of childhood, because she is childish herself, because throughout life she she remains a big child, a sort of intermediary stage between child and man, the true human being. Girls should be reared to be domestic and submissive. Women are the most thoroughgoing and curable philistines. The work by Lombroso and Ferrero, "Woman as a Criminal and Prostitute," is also written in the spirit of Schopenhauer. We have never met with an equally extensive scientific book. It consists of five hundred and ninety pages, that contains so little convincing material in regard to the subject it deals with. The statistics from which the most daring conclusions are drawn are very inadequate. Sometimes a dozen cases have sufficed the author to form a weighty opinion. It is a noteworthy fact that the material contained in the book, which may be regarded as the most trustworthy, has been furnished by a woman, Dr. Mrs. Ternowskaya. The influences of social conditions and social development are almost entirely disregarded. All phenomena are judged from a narrow physiological and psychological point of view, and much ethnological information concerning various peoples is interwoven with the argumentation, without any attempt being made to investigate the nature of this information. According to the authors, as according to Schopenhauer, woman is a big child, an incarnate liar, weak in her judgment, fickle in love, incapable of any heroic deed. The inferiority of woman, so they claim, has been proven by a great many physical differences and characteristics. Woman's love is, at the bottom, nothing but a secondary character of motherhood. All the sentiments of affection that bind a woman to a man are not derived from the sexual impulse, but from instincts of devotion and submission acquired by ad- by adaptation. But how these instincts were acquired, the authors fail to examine. If they did, it would imply an investigation of the social position of woman during thousands of years, which has made her what she is today. The authors describe the dependence and enslavement of woman among different nations and during various periods of civilization. But being blinded by a narrow conception of the Darwinian theory, they trace everything to physiological causes. And disregard the social and economic causes that have had the strongest influence on women's physiological and psychological development. Among other things, the authors discuss the vanity of woman and express the view that among people at a low stage of development, men are the vain sex, which may be observed even today on the he- Hebrides, Madagascar, and among the tribes about the Orin- Orinoco River. As always, on many islands of the Polynesian Ar- Ar- Archipelago, <laughs> and among a number of African and South Sea island tribes, while among nations of high stage of development, women are the vain sex. But why is this so? The answer is simple: among peoples at a low stage of development, matriarchal conditions prevail or have been abandoned, but recently. Here, woman's position is such that she is relieved of the necessity of wooing man. The man woos her, and for this purpose, he adorns himself. He becomes vain. Among peoples at a higher stage of development, especially among all civilized nations, 
Man does not woo woman, but woman woos man. It rarely occurs that woman takes the initiative and literally offers herself to a man. Modesty forbids that. But the offer, nevertheless, is made by manner and dress, the luxury of her personal adornment and her coquetry. Such conduct is forced upon her by the fact that there are more women that, than men and by the social necessity of regarding marriage as a means of support and as the only institution by means of which she may satisfy her sexual impulse and obtain social recognition. Here again, we find purely economic and social causes bringing forth qualities, now in the man and now in the woman, that we are accustomed to regard as quite independent of social and economic causes. From this, we may draw the conclusion that when society has reached a state of development in which every form of dependence of one sex upon the other will cease, vanity and the follies of fashion will disappear, as will many other vices that we deem ineradicable today because we believe them to be inherent in human nature. In regard to Schopenhauer, it must be said that he, as a philosopher, is as biased in his judgment of women as the majority of our anthropologists and medical men who regard her only as a sex being, never as a social being. Schopenhauer had never been married. He failed to contribute his share that one more woman might fulfill the purpose in life that he prescribed to women. This leads us to another, no more pleasant phase of the question. It is generally known that many women remain unmarried because they are given no opportunity to become married. Custom forbids the woman to offer herself. She must allow herself to be chosen. She may not choose. If she's not chosen, she must join that great army of unfortunate women who have missed their purpose in life and who are frequently subjected to a life of poverty and want, sometimes made more bitter still by ridicule. But what causes the numerical disproportion of the sexes? Many are quick to reply to many girl, too many girls are born. The persons who make this statement are mis misinformed, as we shall see. Others draw the conclusion that if women are in the majority in most civilized countries, polygamy ought to be permitted. But polygamy is not only averse to our customs, it also entails the degradation of woman, although that did not prevent Schopenhauer from asserting that to the female sex, general polygamy is a boon. Many men do not marry because they believe that they are unable to support one woman and the children who are likely to be born according to their station in life. Only few men are able to support two women, and among these, many do have two or several wives, one legitimate wife and one or several illegitimate wives. Those privileged by wealth allow nothing to prevent them from doing as they choose. Even in the Orient, where custom and law have suffered polygamy to exist for thousands of years, relatively few men have more than one wife. We speak of the degrading influence of life in Turkish harems, but we overlook the fact that only very few men belonging to the ruling class can afford to maintain a harem, while the great mass of men live in monogamic marriage. In the city of Algiers, at the close of the 60s of the last century, there were among 18,282 marriages no less than 17,319 with only one wife. There were 888 marriages with two wives and only 75 with more than two. In Constantinople, the capital of the Turkish Empire, conditions are probably quite similar. Among the rural population in the Orient, the conditions favoring monog monogamic marriage are still more striking. In the Orient, as with us, material conditions come into consideration that compel the majority of men to content themselves with one wife. But if conditions were equally favorable to all men, poly polygamy could still not be generally maintained because there are not enough women. Under normal conditions, the numbers of persons of both sexes are almost equal, which everywhere points to monogamic marriage. <clears throat> With the exception of Europe, where there are on an average 1,024 female inhabitants for every 1,000 male inhabitants, the male population predominates. Even if we may assume that the information is incomplete, especially in regard to the female sex, and that especially in countries with a Mohammedan population, 
the female population surpasses the given figures. The fact remains that, except in a few European countries, the female population nowhere considerably exceeds the male population. In the meantime, the Imperial Bureau of Statistics in Berlin has published a new compilation of the census in European and non-European countries, which includes 883 million people. When we take into consideration the census not included in this compilation of Italy, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Costa Rica, Argentine Republic, the Transvaal, Orange River Colony, Cyprus, Formosa and Pescadores, the number of enumerated inhabitants of the earth attains 882 million with a general average of 99 or 991 female persons for every thousand male persons. For the enumerated population of the earth, we may therefore assume an almost equal representation of both sexes with a slight preponderance of the male. In Europe, the conditions are different. With the exception of the countries of Southeastern Europe, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Herzegovina, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Greece, the female population predominates. The proportion is least unfavorable in Hungary and Italy, where there are respectively 1,009 and 1,010 female inhabitants for every 1,000 male inhabitants. Belgium comes next with 1,013 females for every 1,000 male inhabitants. Portugal and Norway show the most unfavorable proportion next to these Great Britain, next to these Great Britain with 1,063 females for every 1,000 male inhabitants. France, Germany, Austria, and Russia lie in the middle having for every 1,000 male inhabitants, respectively 1,033, 1,032, 1,035, and 1,029 female inhabitants. In Germany, during the last two decades, each census has shown a more favorable proportion. On December 1st, 1885, the female population exceeded the male population by 988,376 persons. The census of December 1st, 1890 still showed an excess of the female population of 966,806 persons. 1895, 957,401. 1900, 892,684, and according to the census of December 1st, 1905, the excess of the female population had sunken to 871,916 persons, 1,029 females for every 1,000 male inhabitants. The decline of this difference may be chiefly accounted for by the decline of emigration in which the male sex is mainly concerned. This may be clearly seen from the proportion of the sexes in the United States, into which the stream of emigration is mainly directed, and where the dearth of women is almost as great as the excess of women in Germany. In 1900, for every 1,000 men there, uh, there were only 953 women. This emigration from Germany decreased from 220,902 persons in 1881 to 22,073 persons in 1901 and to 19,883 persons in 1908. The fact that more men than women emigrate accounts in the first place then for the difference between the numbers of persons of both sexes. Italy furnishes a good example. For there, the male population still predominated at the beginning of the 40s of the last century, while at present, the female population predominates owing to the large emigration. Furthermore, more men than women meet with accidents in agriculture, industry, commerce, and traffic. Also, more men are temporarily absent abroad as merchants, sailors, marines, etc. Another fact that has been statistically proven and that constitutes an important factor is that women on an average attain a higher age than men and that therefore there are more old women than old men. Among the unmarried persons between the 15th and 40th year, there are as above as, or there are 875,888 more men than women, which appears to be very, very favorable to women. But men between the 50, 15th and 21st year of age, at which age there are 3,175,453 men, 
to 3,064,567 women are with very few exceptions unable to marry. The same may be said of men between the 21st and 25th year of age, the great majority of whom are unable to support a family, while women of this age are all marriageable. When we furthermore consider the fact that for diverse reasons a great many men do not marry at all, the number of unmarried men over 40 years were 567,804. We find that the position of women in regard to marriage is a highly unfavorable one. A great many women then, under present day conditions, are compelled to deny themselves the legitimate satisfaction of the sexual impulse, while men seek and find satisfaction in prostitution. The position of women would become a far more favorable one as soon as a transformation of social conditions would abolish the obstacles that at present prevent hundreds of thousands of men from becoming married. As already mentioned, the disproportion in the numbers of the sexes is due to a great extent to emigration. Obligatory service in the army also drives many young men, frequently the strongest, to seek their fortune abroad. According to official reports of the army, 135,168 men were convicted of illicit emig emigration and 13,055 more cases were being investigated. These figures include men up to the 45th year. This illicit emigration of men from Germany causes a considerable loss. Emigration is especially large in the years following great wars that was seen after 1866 and during the years of 1871 to 1874. We furthermore have great losses of life among, among men by accidents. In Prussia, during the period from 1883 to 1905, no less than 297,983 persons were killed by accidents. Of these, there were, during the one year, 1905, 11,792 men and 2,922 women. From 1886 to 1907, 150,719 persons were killed by accidents in industry, agriculture, and state or municipal employment. Only a small fraction of these were women. Another considerable portion of persons employed in these occupations become maimed or crippled for life and therefore unable to maintain a family. There were 40,744 of these from 1886 to 1907. Others die young, leaving their families in the neediest circumstances. Much loss of life among men is also connected with navigation from 1880 or is connected with navigation. From 1882 to 1907, 2,848 seagoing vessels were sunk, entailing a loss of life of 4,913 members of the crew, almost all men, and 1,275 passengers. Only when the highest valuation of human life has been established, which will be the case in a socialistic community, will society be enabled to prevent a great majority of accidents on land and sea. At present, many persons are killed or maimed as a result of ill-applied economy of employers. In many other cases, accidents are due to excessive speed or over-fatigue of workers. Human life is cheap. When one working man has been killed, there are many others to take his place. Especially in navigation, many preventable accidents occur. By the revelations of Plimsoll in the English Parliament during the 70s, the fact became generally known that many owners of unseaworthy vessels impelled by criminal greed insured these vessels at a high rate and then sent them with their crew to almost certain destruction in order to obtain the amount of insurance. These are the so-called death ships that are not unknown in Germany either. Every year, the marine bureaus are called upon to pronounce their verdicts in connection with a number of marine accidents, and those verdicts usually show the accidents to be due to advanced age or overloading or improper condition of the vessel or insufficient equipment or a number of these causes combined. In the cases of many sunken ships, the cause of their sinking can never be determined because the disasters occur in mid-ocean and no one survives to tell the tale. Many crimes are committed in this way. The stations for saving shipwrecked persons established at the coasts are also very insufficient because they are chiefly maintained by private, private charity. An organized society that will, will regard it as its highest duty to provide equally for all its members will succeed in making all these accidents of extremely rare occurrence. 
but under the present predatory system where human lives are regarded as mere ciphers and the sole aim is to attain the highest possible profit, a human life is sometimes sacrificed in order that a dollar may be gained. 2. Obstacles to Marriage The Excess of Women There are still other causes that make marriage difficult or prevent it entirely. A considerable number of men are prevented from marrying by the state. People condemn the enforced celibacy of the Catholic, Catholic clergy. <clears throat> but they do not mention the fact that a far greater number of soldiers are doomed to celibacy likewise. When an officer of the army wishes to marry, he not only requires the consent of his superiors, he is also denied the free choice of a wife, since it is prescribed that he must possess a certain amount of wealth. In Austria, a captain of the army seeking to marry must give a security of 30,000 florins if he is under 30 years of age, 30,000 florins if, he's, if he is over 30. It's the same thing. Minor officers must give a security of 16,000 florins. In all cases, the fiancé of an army officer must have led an immaculate life, and her standard of living must be suited to his rank. In Germany, officers of the army may seek permission to marry only when they can prove that they have an additional income. The required size of this additional income varies with the different ranks. These are striking proofs of the materialistic conception of marriage maintained by the state. Public opinion in general maintains that men should not marry until they have attained their 24th or 25th year of life. This opinion is founded on the fact that few men are able to support a family before they have reached this age. Only persons who are fortunate enough not to be obliged to win an independent position, persons of princely rank, for instance, form an exception. In their case, we regard it as quite proper that a man should become married at 18 or 19, and a maiden at 15 or 16 years of age. Princes come of age when they are 18 years old, and are considered competent to rule the most numerous people. Common mortals do not come of age until they are 21 years old. This difference of opinion in regard to the age at which marriage is desirable shows that only social considerations are taken into account that have no bearing upon man as a sex being, but nature will not be fettered by definite social conditions and the views that have sprung from these conditions. As soon as a human being has attained maturity, the sexual impulse manifests itself with all its vigor. The advent of puberty with the female sex differs according to the individual, the climate and the mode of life. In the torrid zones, it sets in as early as the ninth or 10th year, and sometimes one meets women of that age with their first babes in their arms. Ugh. But they are fated when they have attained their 25th or 30th year. In the temperate zones, girls usually attain puberty at 14 or 16 years of age. In some cases, later still. The age of pu puberty also differs with girls living in the country from those living in cities. Among the healthy, robust country girls who work hard, as a rule, Menstruation sets in later than among our poorly nourished, effeminate, ethereal young ladies in the cities who suffer from overexcitement of the nerves. <laughs> in the country, puberty usually develops in the normal way. In the city, its normal development is an exception and not infrequently it is accompanied by various symptoms of disease that drive physicians to despair. Often physicians are obliged to say that the only certain cure would be marriage, but in many cases this cure cannot be applied owing to the unsurmountable obst obstacles. All these factors show where we must seek a change. To begin with, we need a complete revolution in our educational methods. We need a system of education that takes both the physical and intellectual qualities into consideration. Furthermore, we need an entirely different mode of living and working, but both cannot be brought about except by a complete transformation of social conditions. Our social conditions have created a profound contradiction between man as a sex being and man as a social being. This contradiction has never been so noticeable as in the present age, and it leads to many evils and diseases to which women especially are subjected. 
In the first place, the woman's organism is far more influenced by her sex mission than man's organism. For instance, the regular recurrence of menstruation. In the second place, she is confronted by the greatest number of obstacles that prevent her from satisfying her strongest natural impulse in a natural way. This contradiction between natural impulse and social constraint leads to anomalies, to secret vices and excesses that are bound to undermine even strong, strong constitutions. Unnatural satisfaction is, fr is frequently aided in a most shameless manner. In the advertisements of newspapers and periodicals, certain manufacturers are recommended in a more or less veiled manner. These advertisements appeal to the wealthy classes of society because the price of the manufacturers are so high that a person of moderate means could not buy them. Besides, we find advertisements of obscene pictures, entire series of photographs, and poetry and prose of a similar character whose very titles are intended to produce sensual excitement. These matters ought to claim the attention of the police and public prosecutors, but these gentlemen are too busy persecuting socialism that will destroy the home and the family to give their full attention to such doings. A part of our novels influence the sentiments of the reading public in the same direction. It is really not to be wondered at if sexual debauchery artificially stimulated gradually becomes a social disease. Many women of the wealthy classes lead an idle, self-indulgent life. They stimulate their nerves by the most extraordinary means and indulge in a certain enjoyment of art that creates an exaggerated sentimentality and heightens their nervous irritability. All this increases the sensual passions and naturally leads to excesses. Among poor people, sexual irritability is frequently heightened by certain kinds of hard work, especially such work that compels people to lead a sedentary life, which creates congestion of the blood and the abdom abdominal organs. Oh my God, this is a little outdated. One of the most dangerous occupations in this respect is constant work at the sewing machine, an occupation in which a great many women are employed at present. This work is so detrimental to the health of women that 10 to 12 hours of it daily will shatter the strongest constitution in a few years. Excessive sexual irritability is also brought about by long hours of work in a high temperature, for instance, in sugar refineries, laundries, printing establishments, etc. The same may be said of night work with artificial light in overcrowded workshops, especially where members of both sexes work together. Here again, we are confronted by a number of evils that clearly show the unhealthful and irrational character of present day conditions. But these evils that are deeply rooted in our social conditions cannot be removed by moralizing or by resorting to palliative measures such as social and religious quacks always have in readiness. It is necessary to strike the root of the evil. The only redemption will be to bring about social conditions that shall enable all persons to obtain a natural education, to lead a healthful mode of life and work, and to find normal satisfaction of all natural and healthy desires. Many obstacles do not exist for the man that do exist for the woman. Owing to his position of rulership, his free choice of a mate is in no wise, ham in no, in no wise hampered except by the social considerations enumerated above. But the nature of marriage as a means of support, the numerical superiority of women and custom all prevent the woman from asserting her wishes. She is obliged to wait until someone seeks her. As a rule, she gladly avails herself of the first opportunity of finding a husband who will save her from the social disregard and indifference that are the usual portion of that unfortunate being, the old maid. Many women look down with disdain upon, upon those of their sisters who are possessed of sufficient human dignity not to sell themselves into prostitution or into the prostitution of marriage to the first man who comes along, but prefer to walk on life's thorny path alone. Nevertheless, the man who wishes to marry for love has social obstacles to consider. He must ask himself, can I support a wife and the children who are likely to come without being weighed down by financial cares? 
If the man has an ideal conception of marriage, if he is determined to let his choice be influenced by love only, this question becomes all the more important. At present, conditions of earning and property are such that many men must answer this question in the negative, and they accordingly prefer to remain unmarried. Many men do not acquire an, an independent position suited to their demands until late in life and are not able to support a wife according to her station in life unless she has a considerable fortune of her own. It must be admitted, of course, that many young men have an exaggerated idea of what constitutes living according to their station, but owing to the false education of many women in their social habits, these young men must indeed be prepared that their wives will make demands upon them that will exceed their means. They frequently do not make the acquaintance of the good, modest women who are simple in their tastes, because they are modest in their manners also and are not met with in society where men have accustomed them accustom themselves to seek wives. While the, women, while the women they do meet often are the kind who seek to fascinate a man by outward appearances and to deceive him in regard to their personal qualities and their material position. When this type of woman has attained an age at which marriage becomes urgent, lures of all sorts are resorted to all the more eagerly. When such a woman has succeeded in capturing a man, she has become so accustomed to outward show, extravagance in dress, and costly enjoyments that she wishes to maintain them in her married life. Here men find themselves on the verge of an abyss, and many prefer, prefer, and many prefer to leave the flowers that bloom at this abyss unplucked. They prefer to pursue their path alone and seek entertainment and enjoyment while maintaining their freedom. Deception and fraud are common practices in bourgeois society. It is not surprising that they also play a part in the contracting of marriages and entail severe suffering of both parties. Statistics show that the educated and wealthy classes as a rule marry later in life than the lower classes. According to Westergaard, the average age of marriage in Copenhagen was, among professional people, merchants, manufacturers, and bankers. 32.2 years, among mechanics and small dealers, 31.2 years, among clerks and commercial employees, 29.7 years, among waiters and domestic servants, 28, and among factory workers, sailors, and day laborers, 27.5 years. In Prussia, from 1881 to 1886, the average, average ages at which men married were minors, 27.6, factory workers, 27.7, Metal workers, 28, stonemasons, 28.2, building trades, 28.6, workers in wood, 28.7, machinists, 29, teaching, 29.1, agriculture, 29.6, railway service, 30, commerce, 30.9, physicians, clergymen, and officials, 31.8 to 33.4. According to Answell, the average age at which the well-to-do and educated classes married in England from 1840 to 1871 was 29.95 years, but since then it has been raised. The fact that the average age of marriage in most European states has been somewhat lowered during the last decades is due to the general growth of industrialism. This may be seen in Germany, Austria, and Sweden, where the increase of early marriages is in connection with the growing number of persons employed in industry. In older industrial countries as France and England, the average age of marriage has been raised. Russia forms an exception. Here the rise in the average age of marriage is due to the abolition of communal property. The number of men who are prevented from marrying for numerous reasons is constantly increasing. This applies especially to the men of the upper classes and the higher professions. Firstly, because they are more pretentious, and secondly, because these men are best enabled to find companionship and pleasure outside of marriage. Conditions are especially unfavorable to women in places where there are many pensioners with their families and few young men. There we find from 20 to 30 women among 100 who are unable to marry. The lack of men seeking marriage is most severely felt by those women who have been accustomed by their social position to require a certain standard of life, but who have no dowry. 
This is especially true of the young girls of those numerous families that depend upon a fixed salary, which leaves them socially respectable but poor. These girls often become dangerous competitors to the working girls who earn their living by embroidery, making underwear, making artificial flowers, hats, gloves, etc. That is, in all those trades in which the employers prefer to have the work done in the homes of the workers. These ladies often work for the lowest wages because they are not obliged to earn their living entirely, but only wish to add to the family income or to earn enough to pay for their clothes. Employers favor the competition of these ladies because it enables them to reduce the wages of the poor proletarian workers and to drive them to the utmost exertion of their strength. Many wives of government officials whose husbands are poorly paid and cannot maintain them according to their standard of living also employ their spare time in such sordid competition, which means increased exploitation among large strata of female proletarians. The agitation carried on by, bourgeois, by the bourgeois women's clubs to elevate women's work and to gain admission for women into the higher professions is especially destined to improve the position of women of the upper classes. In order to do this successfully, these clubs seek the patronage of ladies of high rank. In this respect, the bourgeois women only follow the example of the bourgeois men, who also seek such patronage and become interested in such endeavors that only show small, never large results. In this way, people waste a tremendous amount of effort and deceive themselves and others in regard to the necessity of thoroughgoing reform. In these circles, no doubt is permitted to arise as to the justice and wis wisdom of our present state and social order. The conservative nature of such endeavors prevents clubs of this kind from being permeated by so-called destructive tendencies. At a convention of women in Berlin during the spring of 1894, a minority expressed the thought that it might be well if the bourgeois women would cooperate with the proletarian women, that is, the socialist women. But with a majority of the delegates, this suggestion, suggestion called forth a storm of protest. But the conservative, conservative tendencies of the bourgeois women will not accomplish the liberation of womankind. How many women are excluded from marriage owing to the causes previous, previously stated cannot be definitively determined. The numerical superiority of women in Germany is distributed very unevenly, both in regard to the different countries and districts and in regard to age. At the true marriageable age from 15 to 40 years, the numerical superior, superiority of women in the entire German Empire is 8 for every 1,000 men. The number of male inhabitants between 15 and 40 years of age is 11,100,673. The number of female inhabitants between 15 and 40 years of age is 11,187,779. Hold on. 11,187,779. So we have a super abundance of 87,106 women. In 1900, there were 11,146,833 German women of childbearing age, 18 to 45 years. Among these, only 6,432,772, which is 57.71%, were married. 283,629, 2.54% were widowed. 31,176, 0.28% were divorced. And 4,399,286, 39.47% were single. <clears throat> In all the... Um, in all countries having a similar economic structure, similar conditions exist in regard to the proportion of the sexes. In all these countries, then, a great many women, apart from all other obstacles already mentioned, have no prospect of becoming married. In England, in 1901, among 1,000 women over 15 years, only 496.4 were married. In Scotland, 442.8. In Ireland, 370.9 in Sweden, 468.2 in Norway, 469.9.
How do these facts impress those persons who oppose the struggle of women for independence and equal rights by relegating them to marriage and the home? It is not due to ill will on the part of the women if so many fail to marry. But what becomes of these victims of our social conditions? The nature has been sinned against is expressed in the peculiar features and traits of character by which old maids and ascetic old bachelors are distinguished from other persons in all countries and climates, and goes to show the strong and harmful influence resulting from the suppression of natural instincts. Many forms of hysteria among women are due to this cause. Hysteria is also caused by dissatisfaction in marriage, which sometimes results in sterility. These are the general characteristics of modern marriage and its results. From them, we must draw the following conclusion. Present day marriage is an institution that is closely connected with existing social conditions with which it must stand and fall. But this marriage is in a state of decline and dissolution as bourgeois society itself, which are the salient points that we have determined in regard to bourgeois marriage. Oh, that was a question. Which are the salient points that we have determined in regard to bourgeois marriage? One, the birth rate is declining, although the population is increasing, which shows that the economic status of the family has, de has deteriorated. Two, divorces are increasing more rapidly than the population is growing, and in most cases, women are the ones to seek divorce, although they suffer most in consequence of it, both economically and socially. This shows that the unfavorable factors in marriage are increasing, that marriage is in a state of dissolution. Three, the marriage rate is declining, notwithstanding the fact that the population is increasing, which proves that in the eyes of many persons, marriage no longer accomplishes its social and moral purpose and is regarded as worthless or of doubtful value. Four, in almost all civilized states, there is a disproportion in the number of the sexes, the female sex predominating. This is not due to natural causes, since more boys than girls are born, but to unfavorable social and political factors that are rooted in conditions of state and society. As all these unnatural conditions are especially harmful to women, are established by the nature of bourgeois society and increase with the duration of its existence, this society proves itself, itself incompetent to abolish the evils and to liberate women. To accomplish this, a different social order will be necessary.